Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 30th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. This week, the week in charts is brought to you once again by me. And that's my trading service. I give you a game plan every night. Sometimes I even say, hey, there's nothing worth doing, so let's not do anything, which I wish somebody would tell me that 20-something years ago. Anyway, there's a slam screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I often say, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about? Well, first of all, I'm going to shut down the screen here one second. First of all, I want to talk about handling the Brexit slide. And there's a lot more to it than that. It's like handling the next 100 market downturns because guess what there will be market downturns and then obviously we'll get to that in just one second uh current market conditions uh frame within the brexit slide and uh some longer term signals and things like that and obviously your questions um and your favorite stock picks hold off on the stock picks for now when we get to the charts just to ask about them one at a time if you don't mind in other words uh, punch in a ticker signal, signal um, symbol, you tried to say, and hit return. Okay, so markets go up and markets go down. Now, you don't have to be Captain Obvious or stay in the Holiday Inn Express to know that. So if we take a look at the S&P 500 over the last 20-something years, you can see that there, they, there have been, my mouth is not working yet, uh, some pretty serious ups and downs along the way and obviously we had bow ties sell signals and we had bow tie buy signals sells and buys throughout or on weekly charts and we've had some pretty serious slides and we'll talk a little bit about these signals in just one second now what's interesting is even though markets go up and markets go down even smart people tend to interject logic and emotions into market downturns. As I said in the column a few days ago, I was in Hong Kong a few months back, and the one of the venues was across town, and traffic was pretty bad. So we had a um, the host uh, Teresa Wong was uh, kind enough to have one of the participants join me, and we had a cup of coffee, and then we headed down to the venue because traffic was bad. We hopped on a ding ding, which was quite an experience. And we had a lot of time to talk because it did take a while to get there. And he told me that he was down 30%, just like the Hang Sing. And he couldn't sell now because he was down too much. So what happens is when a market begins to slide, if you don't have a plan in place, and I'm gonna beat a dead horse a little bit today, you just tend to become the proverbial deer and the headlights and just follow the market lower. And then as this poor gentleman was down 30%, he began to think, well, I'm down too much. I can't sell now. Well, and maybe that is the bottom. I don't know, but that's a pretty serious haircut to take if you are a trader. And he was, and he was a pretty smart guy. So, like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker, everyone knows that markets occasionally go down. I used to love those commercials. <laughs> I see potential in you and you. <laughs> I look around this room and I see a lot of potential. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not Pinocchio to you guys. So, as I said, last few weeks uh, worked into the, to the presentations. What you have to realize is not only do markets go down, but all trades eventually end badly. And fortunately, I just had one end badly on me right a few seconds ago. That's why I shut down the screen. Um, you almost witnessed an F-bomb live. But as I said last few weeks, all trades will eventually end badly. In fact, that's, that's one of my epiphanies, and it's one of the reoccurring themes that you're going to see in these presentations and as I said over the past few weeks one of three things are going to happen on every trade 
and frame within my methodology one you're obviously will either get stopped out at either a full loss or in this case i drew a little bit of a trailing stop maybe slightly less than a full loss you're going to get the initial profit target which in our case we set at one percent plenty of youtubes out there in that so feel free to check them out or please check them out if you get a chance and then you scratch out at zero percent but you lose a little bit on this but overall you make one percent on a trade and the third thing that could happen is the best of both worlds where you get a short-term trade and the stock keeps on going and you trail your stop higher but in the end again all trades in badly you're going to have to give up some of the trend but like i've said over the last couple of weeks since i've been showing this graphic you have to look at the net net so if you're selling up here i'm sorry you have to look at the net net if you're buying down here and selling up here then you did pretty darn good okay and obviously not on every trade if it's on every trade you'd never see my fat ass again but every now and then we'll get a 50 60 70 and and sometimes even several hundred percent move on a trade but yeah in the end we will give up a piece of that but we might stop out at 100 percent gain a 70 percent gain or maybe even more but yeah we were up over 100 percent at one point maybe but so what you have to look at the net net change and as I often preach, and I've got plenty of slides out there and that, plenty of um, YouTubes from the week of charts. But if you're not, if you quit when you're at 20%, you'll never be up 40%. And if you quit at 40%, you'll never be up 80% and so on and so forth. And you never know. Sometimes a market just might have a sharp sell-off and then turn around right before it hits that stop and take off again. And then you go back to trailing stops. So you will have to take a little heat along the way. And by the way, heat to open positions uh, tends to be treated differently. Uh, like Dennis, Richard Dennis once said um, in, in one of those turtle books, uh, Curtis Faith turtle book, by the way, I think it was uh, in that book. And Curtis Faith was saying that Richard Dennis treated drawdowns to open profits differently because it's part of the process. Now, if you're drawing down because you're not honoring your stop or you're not following the signals, you're taking bad signals, either one, a combination of two, and you're you're starting to exit way down here and your stop was way up here or you're taking bad signals to begin with that's a different type of drawdown okay so just know that all trades will eventually end badly now one thing that i thought about a while back is so why is it that most don't plan for the inevitable and the reason is the moment that you make a plan is the exact moment that you admit you could be wrong. And we don't want to admit that we're wrong. Okay. It's not in our makeup, especially successful people who are trying to learn how to trade and, I, and people who are attracted to this business are the absolute worst people that should be trading the smart people like this aforementioned gentleman in Hong Kong. Okay, very smart gentleman, knew how to trade, very smart guy, but he got caught like the proverbial deer in the headlights. So we don't like to admit that we're wrong if we're successful, but sometimes we have to. In fact, on all trades, we will be wrong at some point. So all you have to do is, as I often say, Around the house, my wife will have a plumbing project or some other honeydew. That's why you guys in the service always hear me say, I'll be in my office dodging honeydews. <laughs> Sometimes I come in here to work to avoid the honeydews on the weekends. But it's always, she always looks at something on the surface and it always looks a lot easier than it really is. So I know it's hard. It's not hard to plan the trade. That's pretty easy. It's hard to actually follow the plan so all you have to do is you know like on these plumbing projects and there you are simple little plumbing project there you are three hours later a couple trips to the hardware store soaked etc now how do you handle the downturns well first and foremost you have to have a stop in place and as i often preach 
He who fights and runs away lives to fight another way, another day. So that's another one of those things is you can stop that. Eh, so what? Okay. Yeah, drop an F-bomb as long as you're not mic'd. <laughs> but get over it, okay? Now, how do you handle downturns? First of all, you want to take all signals serious. Greg Morris, good friend of mine, wrote in his book, Investing with the Trend, we treat all signals as if they will become the big one. And Greg used to run about $6 billion. So they would just get out the way when things began, when they got signals and things began looking kind of questionable, they just simply got out the way. So the question is, is this the big one, Elizabeth? And I don't know, but I'm definitely paying attention just in case. So if we take a look at the S&P 500 on a weekly basis, going back to last summer, we had a sell signal. This is a weekly bow tie. And it would have triggered somewhere in here. And you could see it did work initially. And it looked like the market was going to fall out of bed. Fall out of bed. But what happened? The market took off again. And then it began to roll over. And that looked pretty serious. And then what happened? It came back up. And now, as we'll talk about in just one second, it looks like it's trying to roll back over. By the way, somebody asked me recently about this bow tie here. This is a minor bow tie buy. Okay. Major signals come off of all-time highs, and major signals remain in place until and unless the highs get taken out. So this is a major signal here. If you go in and look on my YouTube channel, if you go, I'm getting better and better at getting organized. But if you go in, especially with the classic ones coming up, I'm putting some ones from 2014 up. Once I get those up, then I'll, I might go back further, 2013 and beyond. But if you do a search for major, you should come up with a few uh, videos talking about major signals. So I don't want to beat the dead horse too much on that. Just know that a signal off of all time highs is a major signal. Signals somewhere in between are minor signals. Not that they're not useful and should be completely ignored, but this signal here trumps this signal. Okay, so this is a minor buy and this is a major. So, okay, so it trumps this one. So it's huge. The signal's huge. <laughs> so I guess it didn't work. Okay, so the question is, we have a sell signal, so are we shorting with both this? And the answer is no, although we did get somewhat aggressive on the short side in late 15 and early 16 during those market slides. Overall, there's been more long side setups than short side setups. And with every setup, you have to take it and frame it within the context of the overall market. Now, right now, if we're looking at a longer term chart, I often preach about the net net. And I've been boring you guys to death and girls by talking about the fact that we haven't made any forward progress on a net net basis since 2014 in the S&P 500. And 2013 in the Russell, and obviously 2014 also in the um, NASDAQ. So at best, it's been sideways. So frame within this context, it's going to have to be a pretty good looking setup. And ideally, something that could trade contra to the market. Now, obviously, back here, Back around February, we were shorting, and um, when was this? And then I think we were shorting, oops, February was over here. So back around here, we were definitely shorting the market. But for the most part, especially if something like a long size setup when the market was sliding, it had to be something that could trade contra to the overall market. So if the market appears to be headed lower, then you do want to sort of favor that short side. And if it's sideways like now, you want to consider issues that could trade contra to the indices, 
such as super inefficient stocks and commodity related stocks. Now, just to bring this graphic back up because I have all the trades on here or most of the trades on here. Um, I, I didn't put the shorts on here because I figured that would be confusing to have shorts going up, but we did have some shorts that actually worked. But of the longs, you could see that they were IPOs or super speculative IPOs, I should say. Would know fundamental to hit them in the ass. Commodity related stocks. There's a commodity related stock, and there's a commodity related stock here. I don't know what this one is. This one's this was a speculative issue. Sorry about that. This one here, CNX. I get these two confused sometimes. Is a commodity related stock, and we're still long that one. As is RRC. So when the market's sideways or iffy, if the market's going down, you want to definitely find something that could trade contra to the overall market. And again, something very speculative, something that's inefficient can trade independently of the markets because it's, it's not going to really get too caught up in a fundamental. But a multi-international conglomerate, okay, or a big bank might get caught up in that potential economy collapse, potential fundamentals, et cetera. Um, a while back, I looked at one of those uh, big winners that we had, and, and I think it might have been an IPO. It was like $15 a share, and they lost $2.76. That was their earnings. So they had no earnings. By the way, that's that's the best stocks you want to trade, stocks without earnings. Okay, write that down. That or headed higher, obviously, because they're trading purely on emotions. And you're not confusing the issue with facts. Now, getting back to the market timing, one thing I want to point out with market timing is it's very tough. Okay. And by the way, the market doesn't always go up longer term. I'm, I'm working on a beginner's course, and some of that will be made free. I hadn't decided how much in, in pricing and all this other stuff. But one thing that I want to talk about, it's the same thing I talked about at the beginning of layman's, is that the market doesn't always go up longer term. And, and as I've said before, I'll be at a party and I'll say, well, you know, if, if the stock market is iffy or sideways, I'll say, well, you know, the market can go 25 years or more without making new highs. And then people actually laugh in my face. But that's very much a true statement. And borrowing from Greg on that, the buy and hold, this is where the lies, damn lies, and statistics come in. So there's a tiny bit of truth in there. The buy and hold saying that the market always goes up longer term is based on an 81-year time horizon. And like Sweet Brown once said, ain't nobody got time for that. Okay. So, but getting back to market timing, market timing is tough. One thing I thought about is like, why is this lie universally preached the market goes up longer term as well? Much easier to be a salesperson than it is to be a market timer. Friend of mine, wife, a friend of my wife's friend, she just got an investing last year and she calls me kind of a little panicky early this year. And, and um, she called her guy and her guy says, oh, don't worry about it. We're in for the long haul. Well, that's fine as long as you don't lose 50% or more of your money. NASDAQ, in what, 2000, lost 70-something percent. So if you're in growth stocks, obviously you can lose at least that much. Now, getting back to market timing, market timing is tough, okay? And that's why I trade individual stocks because I'm seeking out market inefficiencies. We don't have enough time to get into those uh, inefficiencies today and, and why, the importance of that. But just know that something that has a little bit more excitement behind it, a smaller cap issue with less institutional institutions following, at least initially. Obviously, at some point, it would be nice to have some institutional followership. But you don't want something that has a lot of institutions following it. Not that I, not that I try to even factor that into the equation. I think it's 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 probably a bad idea to build systems around that. It used to used to make sense to me to do that, but you really don't have to worry about these things. Just look at the chart, tend to go after the smaller cap, more volatile issues within reason. And again, I have plenty of articles on my website on that. Read Better the Devil You Know, which you could just do a search on my website for it. And also I have some of those type of articles under free reports, which is in the store. 
But just know that in an efficient market, you have a lot of players, okay? So in the S&P 500, you got the E-mini guys, the one lotters You got uh, the Fed coming in and, and, and mucking around with things a little bit. You've got big institutions. You've got people that are hedging. You've got people that are indexing. So there's a lot of people in there canceling each other out. But you still need a general framework to work around. So, as I said quite a bit, we had that weekly bow tie signal last summer, and I pointed out to everybody, it said this stays in effect until unless we make new highs. I just said that a few minutes ago. So somebody sent me an Instagram. Dave, you've been wrong on that. Have you considered a different line of work? It's like, well, you know, I get my ass handed to me quite often. I often consider a different line of work, okay? But you have to have a framework to work around. And so I think you need to err on the side of being prudent and cautious as long as you have a sell signal in place. Now, one thing to realize is that sometimes tops are obvious events, okay? Let's say that the market would have just kept sliding on this Brexit thing and go down, 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 okay? And we did have this big sideways movement over the last year all of a sudden just out of the blue bam market starts going straight down so it becomes a bit of a, an event top and those are pretty obvious but other times they can be more of a process so getting back to the s p 500 we did have again that bow tie last summer on a weekly chart and again it stays in effect until and unless the market goes on to make new highs. But notice what's beginning to happen now. The 10 week moving average has turned down and these moving averages, it's kind of hard to see. I'm not sure this one may have turned a little bit, but I guarantee you because it's math and there's no um, arguing about it. If this market closes below on a weekly basis, the moving average, the moving averages on the exponential ones will turn down too. Okay, and just write that down. Anytime a market, you know, actually learn this from Greg. Anytime a market closes above a moving average, it turns up. An exponential moving average, that is. Anytime a market closes below an exponential moving average, it'll turn down. It doesn't matter how long the average is, it'll turn down. That's why the bow ties, something that I've discovered empirically, and I knew it front weight of the data, but I didn't actually realize that it worked just like that. I didn't realize that it turns as soon as the market crosses below. In fact, look back here. This is a good example here. Notice that the moving average here turned down as soon as it crossed below, okay? And then notice that this moving average turned down. You see that right there? As soon as it crossed below. So they do tend to catch up with price faster. On a short-term basis, I like the 10-day simple. And then obviously when you back out to a weekly chart, that becomes a 10-week moving average, okay? And then intermediate term, this is a 20 and this is a 30, okay? So sometimes you get the second mouse signals where the early bird might get the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. And if you go back and look, I think it was the Euro many years ago, we had a bow tie there and it almost made us, uh, it almost went up to that prior high and then it rolled over. So your main signal that was back here remained in effect and then you had a second bow tie over here, and that turned out to be the real deal. So sometimes those second signals become the real deal. Why, Mickey? I don't know. It's just <laughs> technical analysis is a very exciting, and I've got to kind of jazz it up a little bit. Um, I think I have a couple ladies in this presentation. Uh, not participating. Well, participating and in the slides. <laughs> just to try to make it a little exciting. Um, Anyway, so sometimes these second, second signals could be the real deal. And it just, it's, if you think about it, it sets up within like a double top. Sometimes that first one is just kind of like a warning shot and then your real deal here. I, I know a trader and I don't know if he's still trading or not or what the deal is. He's an older gentleman and I don't know if he, I don't know his whereabouts. Uh, but I did know when, when I, when I did know him, uh, he told me that whenever they get a new guy in the office, 
and they're teaching him how to trade, he can only take second signals. Now, he's going to miss a lot of first signals, obviously. He's going to miss all the first signals that materialize, okay? But that second signal, like it's kind of like the second mouse. The second mouse gets the cheese. So he would do that with the new guys until they built confidence, and then they were able to trade more patterns and more signals. So we could have a second mouse signal setting up here at some point in the S&P 500. So I just want to point that out. And again, it's been more of a process than an event. And one thing that I've shown over the past several months is that we had this nice, nice longer term trend in the S&P 500. And then what happened? It's slowly been going sideways. Is it rolling over? I don't know. But you hate for a market or you don't want to see a market lose momentum like this, especially when a lot of people have kind of smoked the hopium and bought into the, the buy and hold yet again. It's amazing that it's a new crop comes along every few years. So when it comes to news, am I worried about this Brexit thing? It's like, no, no, absolutely not. What me worry? Like death taxes and unlit all rigs, there's nothing you could do about it. And I told the story before, so let me see if I could kind of sum it up. We were in a race from Galveston, uh, Texas, to Biloxi, Mississippi. And we were at, it was at night, and we were caught in a low-pressure system, and it was, it was bad. And we were the smallest boat in the uh, fleet and we were just getting creamed and pounded and we'd get halfway up a wave and then slide back down and then we the wind in the trough would blow us over. So much for a short story. Anyway, I was sick as a dog and, and the two other accomplished sailors on the boat, they were downstairs throwing up. And I knew, never go downstairs. If you ever get seasick, never go down into a cabin. That's the absolute worst thing you could do. I'd rather be up top getting pelted by the rain and getting hit in the face with the salt water and the waves than to be down below with a bucket. Because once you go down, you don't come back up, at least not until conditions get better. Anyway, so I was kind of hanging over the side, and every now and then I'd, I'd, I'd hand these two guys, uh, one, of, one of the two, the, the helm. And they, they'd never been in a sailboat in their life, and they were like chewing tobacco, and they were just they were just all amazed with this. They Instead of, you know, we had foul weather gear costing hundreds of dollars, and they – they picked up a couple little ponchos along the way, and then the first big wave came along. It, it took the poncho off of them. It was pretty funny. Anyway, so they were immune to the seasickness, and every night and I give them the helm so I could go back to to uh, talking to Ralph and talking about my Buick. And I just say, I'd point an oar rig off in the distance and said, "Just just go to the light." And they were like, "Oh, go to the light. The light is good." And they would making all these jokes and I'm just, you know, off the back of the boat. And then one time, a few hours later, we were like in a, in a, in a, a minefield of all rigs. There were just all rigs everywhere. And we passed them pretty close to them, close enough to hear like the, the, the machinery operating and the pumps and the water dripping off the deck and all that other stuff. I mean, like really close. And I was sick again. And I said, uh, just, Hey, take the helm. And they're like, well, where should I go? And, I said, look, just just stay away, stay away from the uh, stay away from the rigs, stay away from the lights, okay? And they they were started saying, stay away from the lights, the light is bad, you know, or whatever. And then all of a sudden it got quiet, so I look up from hanging my head over, I'm like, what? And they're like, well, what if they're not lit? And I and I said, well, you don't have to worry about them. And he's like, what do you mean you don't have to worry about it? Well, what will happen? I said, well, we'll hit it. And, and and he's like, well, won't we sink? I'm like, probably. Uh, or it's almost it's almost a sure thing that a, a plastic boat, okay, fiberglass is considered plastic, okay, it's going to crumble if it hits an oil rig. The oil rig's not going to give. And he's like, well, what do you mean don't worry about it? What will happen? It's like, oh, the boat will sink. I don't know. We'll be out here. Won't we die? It's like, I don't know. It's like. No need to worry about it, though, because there's nothing you could do about it, okay? There's no way you're going to see an unlit rig out there in the pitch black, especially with the rain coming down and the winds and everything else. So there's nothing you could do about Brexit 
or the next terrorist attack or the situation in Nigeria. So you just have to have that plan in place and roll with the punches. And every now and then you're going to get punched, okay? And you just have to live with it. So you have to accept the fact that the market could do whatever it wants and you can't worry about it. Now, obviously, again, all you have to do when you're handling a drawdown is plan your trade and trade your plan. And and by the way, as in vertical control, hope is not a plan. I was talking with Tom Cullen a while back, telling him how I, I'm always quoting him on his stuff. And somehow it came up, he came up, he mentioned that his, uh, his commander once said back in his army days, that as in birth control in battle, you know, hope is not a strategy. So hope is not a strategy when it comes to markets. Now, one thing to remember, and this slide keeps finding its way back to the presentations, there's only three states in what a market can exist. It's either going up, and that would be demand. It's either going down, and that would be supply. And sometimes, as you know, it could be going sideways. And that means that demand equals supply. So when you back that S&P chart way out, you could see that demand has met supply or supply has met demand, however you want to look at it. So always keep that in the back of your mind, and that's always part of your framework, okay? So truly ask yourself, which is it? It may not be what you want, but unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. So in summary, all you have to do, I know, easier said than done, is plan your trade and trade your plan. Okay. Um, these announcements are a few weeks old, but yeah, I'm still rolling out some, some content on the back end of the website. So if you want to do some searches and all, you can find some of that. Um, also, if you go to YouTube, and look for the classics and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's Dave Landry, D-O-T-C-O-M. Or I think you can also find it by going to YouTube slash C Dave Landry. And then it's on my website a few places, places too. So the rollout continues and a lot of those uh, weaker charts are being put on the back end. If you have any questions, anything you want to see in this show uh, for next week, any questions for today, you can obviously ask them live, but any questions for next week, Feel free to shoot me an email at daviddavelander.com. And, of course, check out my website. All right. Let's hop into the uh, the market itself. And then if you have any questions, you guys can start, and girls can start asking questions about individual stocks uh, now, if you like. Okay. Let's take a look at the S&P 500. Okay, by the way, um, last week I talked about, yeah, keep those stock picks coming. We'll get to them in just a few minutes. Last week I talked about like an opening gap reversal on a news event. And we had the, hey, Brexit's not going to happen. And then it did. But on the day that news came out, there was a big um, opening gap reversal on the news. When was that? Let's see if we can still see that real quick. Well, it's in last week's week of charts. So check that out. But getting back to the S&P 500, just real quick, if you are going to trade off news, which I recommend you don't, on a position trading standpoint, then you wait for the market to cross above the pre uh, news announcement day. So I guess you wait for that sell-off to be eradicated and then you look to go long. 
I would not trade that strategy in and of itself, but it's something that's worth putting in your tool quiver, your tool quiver, your toolbox, just to kind of help you understand the markets. And it might it might dovetail in with some other things that you're doing at the time. But the S and P is having a pretty serious retrace, but we're still not even back to where we were when, well, I guess the 23rd was pre-Brexit, right? But it's coming back pretty strong, and especially with today's action uh, on top, it looks pretty impressive. It'll be interesting to see if the market could keep up its euphoria into the weekend or if it's going to sell first and ask questions later. Now, again, longer term, put things in perspective. Where are we now? Where were we? We haven't made a whole lot of forward progress, so it's sideways at best. So make sure you really like a setup before going after it. And then today you might think, oh, he's like Mikey. He eats everything. And that's not the case, okay? Um, it's so funny. People find me at different periods of time. People found me back in 1999. It's like this guy has never met a setup he didn't like, okay? And then sometimes markets chop it sideways. Like now it's like this guy hates everything. So – this guy's a perma bear. That was 2007, 2008, early 2009. You know, it's like 2009 up until 14. You know, this guy's always bullish. So, no, I'm a trend follower. I'm just following the trend. And just like you can't catch a tan when there's no sun shining, if the market's going sideways, it's not a trend. Okay. So, it's very hard, especially without a tailwind behind you to trade during these sideways conditions. And that's why, as I said earlier, you want to be in those more inefficient issues, such as some IPOs or more speculative issues that are a little bit higher in volatility. So P's are crawling back up a little bit in here. I wouldn't get too excited just yet, okay, because they're not to where they were last week and not to where they were a few months ago or they're right there below and then they're right where they were a couple of years ago nasdaq composite same sort of deal there it's got a little bit more work cut out for it though it's doing a pretty serious retrace but first so far it doesn't look like it has a it doesn't look like i'm sorry i tried to multi-process by reading a question uh it, it has a ways to go before getting back to its recent highs and then even if it does, it still has a lot, a lot of overhead supply to get through from there. Now, overhead supply, again, is not, as I often preach, I should say, there's nothing magical about it. It's just a place where there, ha there has been a lot of trading, and traders might be looking to get out at break even at those levels. I'm not a huge fan of volume, although I might start playing with uh, volume by price again since I've, I've been using stockcharts.com a little. Uh, and you can put the volume by price in. And but all that does is basically shows you what's already there. It's you'll have a volume bar off the side, and I'd be willing to bet if I put volume by price in, I'd have a big volume bar right here, which would show that hey, there's a lot of overhead supply right above the market. So the reason I bring volume into it is the point is is that I don't use volume, but the point is that you know that there's a lot of trading in that area because you can see it in the bars, but it's also backed by a lot of volume likely in that area too and it's just human nature people look to get out of break even when they get back i i would imagine my wife's friend because she's jittery because she got in late okay last in people are usually first out so whoever got in not that long ago or let's say over the even even two years ago okay is going to be a little jittery so those johnny come lately's tend to be the worst nothing wrong with investing and i recommend that everybody invest okay I should say saving because it, I, I don't think there's any good investments out there. There's no good long-term investments unless, unless they're going up. Okay. And I guess that's fodder for another show, but that just kind of goes back to market goes up, markets go down. The S and P 500 is not a good longer term investment. Okay. And that's why you need to be more of a trader type. And that's why I believe in trading individual issues. Anyway, sideways at best, somewhat longer term in the S&P 500. And here's the deal. Don't worry if you want to get into this market, if you want to buy this market. You only have a little bit to wait. You're only going to miss the move from here to here, okay? And it's not worth trying to get in here anticipating it's going to go to new highs 
let it go to new highs and then look to get in okay let's take a look at the russell russell just has a ton and ton of overhead resistance to deal with shorter term it's kind of in a retrace rally too like the nasdaq not quite as far back to its prior highs as like the peas so so far kind of dubious shorter term and then longer term still has its work cut out for it tomorrow is going to be pretty interesting because a lot of people are going to have a hard time i think a lot of people could have a hard time holding on into the weekend okay maybe stranger things have happened but i think we just have to wait and see some areas like the energies have been improving as of late but kind of sideways shorter term but doing pretty good especially on a relative basis compared to the uh, overall market let's take a look at the underlying commodity there you can see that yesterday the oil had a, oil had a pretty good ride and it's down a little today but it's trying to come back in here so so far it looks like the uptrend from lows remains intact but commodities could be really choppy as you know so that's what's going on in oil metals and mining kind of having that sideways action too let's take a look at those real quick if i can find them and then yeah i'll get to your question rick just one sec uh you can see sideways at best over the short term but somewhat in immediate term so far they still look like they're in an uptrend from lows okay you don't want to rush out and buy any new positions possibly in these areas just yet but if they break out and we start seeing some decent setups then it might be worthwhile okay if if this weekly sell signal is correct what would make you say the sideways top is in and we are now going down well, I think that the top is how it depends on I guess it depends on your semantics or how, what do you want to call it? Uh the top is in place until and unless we make new highs and stay there, then we have to reevaluate things. But right now, it it looks like a big picture. It looks like if, something you'd see in like an old Edwards and McGee book or a Shawbacker book where the market just makes this big, long, long, long top. So I'm not super duper bearish. We're not even short anything now, okay? We had a few shorts showing up recently and we didn't take them. I just didn't think it was worth while from a setup standpoint and, and it didn't seem like the market. I mean, you gotta keep it in perspective, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, and then sideways, okay? Back here, it sort of looked like the end of the world and it was pretty obvious okay but then of course it turned around and went right back up and then right here it kind of looked like the end of the world pretty obvious but longer term you could see what kind of electrocardiogram in here so i'm still if you have to label me yeah i guess i'm bearish because it's not going up longer term like it was since 2009 okay so that's why I've been so cautious, and that's why you're seeing IPOs, speculative issues, and then earlier this year, late last year, we had a lot of shorts that were coming in, okay? Rick has another question. So you would short each opportunity as if it was a big one? Uh, okay, I, I see where you're going with that. No, it's, it's a respect thing. OK, so we have that weekly signal. Now, a weekly signal might take a while to unfold, but we respect it. And then along those lines of respecting things, we treat every stop as if the stock will keep on going through the stop. OK, if you didn't feel that every stock was just going to bust through your stop and keep on going, then why would you use a stop in the first place, okay? So I'm treating that signal seriously. And what Greg does, and I, I don't want to speak too much for him, but they come out of the market when they have a sell signal. I don't know how they get out of the market or how they used to get out of the market or how that works, but they treat it seriously and maybe what they do maybe treating it seriously means that they are prudent in honoring their stops on existing positions and they don't go after anything new for a while so 
me treating it, I can't really speak for Greg and I probably shouldn't, but me treating it seriously, me taking it seriously means being prudent. Means that, okay, the market has a sell signal. It hasn't rolled over, but it's gone sideways. So it could be, it could be rolling over. So, hey, these energies look pretty good coming off their lows in here. Hey, these metals and mining look pretty good coming off their lows. Hey, these IPOs are still going up in spite of this market that's somewhat dubious or sideways at best. So the point I'm trying to make, and that's what I made in the column, and I've been making that point for the last, I guess, year in a column, is that you don't rush out and sell the form. You don't short with both fists, but you do pay attention to what the database is telling you, and you frame every setup within the structure of the overall market. Now, the problem is, as I just said, we now know that this market is erratic and sideways, okay? It's not a route, at least longer term, in one direction. So that's why I've been even super selective on the short side, too, thinking, hmm, is this a short I want to take? Well, it's got a little overhead. Uh, I'm sorry, it's got some support below the market in this particular stock, so maybe I don't want to take that one. And when we start looking at stocks, maybe that will come up, okay? So you don't want to short with both fists, but you want to pay attention to it, okay? Now, as far as sectors, uh, some obviously still remain in downtrends, drugs, transports, quite a few others, okay? Uh, last day or two notwithstanding. And take a look at like the transports, if I can find them. There they are. They look pretty ugly in here. Big retrace, roll back over. Uh, I got asked about the banks. I'm bearish on the banks, but it's been a bumpy ride. They're kind of all over the place, okay? So let's see if we got a weekly. Where was your weekly bow tie there? You had a well, it's kind of sloppy, but you had a weekly bow. The Bix looks a little bit better as far as um, I don't have the Bix on this particular uh, computer. Well, I have it in a browser. I can pull up. But anyway, banks in general not looking so hot. They broke down out of this sideways range in here. Some of your bigger conglomerate type of areas like manufacturing. Uh, Recently touched brand new highs, but then sold off hard. So this was a this was a what they would call, I suppose you could say, this is a a bull trap. When you see a market break out the new highs like this and come right back in, so go through the sectors at your leisure, and you're going to see quite a few that have banged out new highs recently and have sold off hard. They might be trying to come back, but if they don't come back with vigor, I think they're going to be in a lot of trouble. Semiconductors on a shorter term basis broke out the new highs and then bam imploded in here. So I'm seeing a lot of these bull traps. Okay. It looks like, Hey, here's the all clear markets of new highs come in. The water's fine. And then they come back in. So sector action is somewhat dubious too. So this is where you want to pay careful attention to your setups and you have to frame that within the overall market that sideways at best that erratic at best and say, do I really, really like this setup? Is it worth putting capital in the harm's way? And if you say yes, then you take it, okay? If not, then pass. All right, you guys want to look at some uh, individual stocks? That's cool, all right. Okay, John says, is, it character is this the characteristic of wisdom not to do desperate things, said Thoreau? It is the characteristic of wisdom not to do desperate things, said Thoreau. When you don't place a stop, you have tendency to do desperate things. Yeah. And as I often preach, obviously with every decision comes emotions and stress. Every decision. What you're going to have for lunch today, okay, has an emotion, consequence, and stress attached to it. I put out a game plan, buy XYZ at 10, put a stop in at eight it's a volatile stock okay and take partial profits at 12 game plan goes out monday night tuesday the stock triggers wednesday my inbox starts filling dave i didn't take the trade what should i do now okay or if they took the trade it stops out three months from now i get a i get a, a an email dave i didn't honor my stop what should i do well Every time you deviate from your plan, you're adding a decision, and then it kind of grows geometrically from there. 
And then you end up, I wish I was an easier way to say this. I can't, it's kind of crude to say it, but that mental thing you do where you just kind of go over things over and over again. I can't say what I want to say. Um, but you end up in that where it's just going over and over and over in your head as opposed to following the plan. And I know it's cliche and I know it's difficult, but if you could do the hard thing, your life is going to get a lot easier longer term. And, and what I always tell people is, okay, you can't do that. Then on your next trade and just that next trade, follow that plan. Yes, that's what I want to say, Don. I can't, I don't know if that's crude to say that or not. <laughs> All right, let's start looking at some individual issues. We could always jump back to sectors and, st and such if you like. Okay, uh, TWLO, that's going to be an IPO. Now, somebody was all excited about this one because they thought it was my IPO breakout pattern. There is a caveat to that pattern that $20, at least over the last couple of years, seems to be the magical number. It has to be below $20 before buying it on this breakout system. But this, so with that said, this stock is not set up as a breakout pattern, but it might be worth watching on a pullback. So absolutely put that in your watch list, Rick. GDXJ, that's going to be the junior gold miners. GDXJ. Well, one thing I'm sort of seeing in here is it's kind of making a little bit of drift. It, it broke out, and now it's making a little drift. These gold stocks have been tough because it looks like they're gonna looks like they're off to the races, and then they drift higher. And as I often say, you want to see a market look like this. You want to see that gradual trend turn into an accelerated trend. So you want to see acceleration in trend. And then these gold stocks have been kind of tough. And then they did kind of begin to accelerate finally here. Then they sold off, took off, sold off. They kind of became like Jackie Mason, up, down, up, down, up, down. But, yeah, longer term, GDXJ is at a pretty nice uptrend. But it's a little all over the place over the short term. And, again, as I said, those commodities can be kind of tough. So you have to zoom in and see that it hasn't made a, for, a lot of forward progress in a while. So for me to actually get excited, I like to see it just kind of blast higher like this and then look to play a pullback on that one, okay? COTV for Jim. This is uh, this is one I was talking with, with a client just uh, there yesterday. Yeah, CO, COTV looks kind of interesting. Um, it, it did fit that breakout pattern, but it was kind of like right on the cusp of that 20. So it was kind of a, a tough call on that one. But it is broken out, and I wouldn't jump in now. But what I would do is watch it and then look to play the next pullback. So the, the initial breakout pattern, which I'm not going to give you, and, and you know me, I give pretty much everything away, but that's part of the IPO course. So out of respect to the people who bought the course, uh, is a first, what, uh, first uh, a pioneer type of pattern. You're looking to get in at the first possible chance. And, and at least you have to wait at least five days, but anytime after that, you could possibly get in provided of course you have the signal and it triggers but in a lot of cases like that one we just looked at earlier TWLO especially because it's higher price we want to wait for a secondary signal uh, maybe a deep retracement maybe the next pullback or the, I should say the first pullback or something like that okay so now where this stock is now I would wait for the next pullback to look to get in okay It's hard to convince yourself you're doing something good and right when your action has a bad outcome. In other words, you're stopped out of a loss. Yeah, it is, okay? But that's the problem. We're not made to trade. So if you're in goal-oriented, as you successful people who are here today are, then it's going to be tough for you to trade because – you're looking for success, not failure, obviously. Unfortunately, you have to be process-oriented 
And you have to say, okay, I honored my stop. That was a good thing. Now, do a postmortem, of course, and make sure that everything was there in perfect hindsight, obviously. And some, you know, a lot of times it won't be in perfect hindsight, but you'll get better and better at it. It's the, the deliberate practice thing I talked about last week in the column and, and in this uh, webinar. So, Definitely do that postmortem to make sure you had the trade that you would take if you were seeing it for the first time today and be brutally honest with yourself. And if you say yes, you would have taken that trade and you should reach a point with your methodology to where that becomes pretty obvious. OK, as I've said time and time again, whenever I'm looking at uh, archives of the trading service every now and then, I'll go and, and look at a few things longer term. And I remember when I used to do it. Quite a few times I'd say, what the hell was I thinking? But I find myself doing that less and less and less in more recent times because I'm obsessing before I get into the trade and not afterwards. So I'm doing that obsessing before saying, okay, uh, I like to set up. Well, it's okay. Setup's okay. And the market is just crap. So set up okay, market crap, I think I'm going to pass. Can you walk away and be okay? So that's I do that litmus test, and I say, all right, market's crap, set up is okay, then I'm going to pass. Market's crap, set up looks fantastic, I might give it a shot, okay? So as long as you're taking the best going in and you're honest with yourself and you get stopped out, so what? OK, I know. Ha ha. Easier said than done. But you have to reach a point where it's just, well, it comes with the territory. OK, if you run a business, you're going to have some business expenses. I don't get pissed off when I have to go to Office Depot. Not that I go to Office Depot that much for supplies, but I did find myself in there not too long ago. It's just it just comes with the territory. Now, I know I'm kind of matter of fact about it, but. It's almost like a game I have to play with myself to stay matter of fact about it. I mean, I, yeah, earlier in this presentation, you, you could tell I was a little aggravated with the situation. But talking through it now, I did the right thing. I let my stop take me out, and that's the right thing to do. And you just have to reach a point where you feel like, okay, I'm doing the right thing, and you want to shout next when you get stopped out. And as I often say, as Douglas, uh, the late, great Mark Douglas used to say, a good salesman will make a few sales calls, get rejected, and then go get a cup of coffee and then get excited because he knows that he's chipping away at it, okay? Um, I'm reading a book, Eight to Be Great, right now. It's a, it's a little quick read. I don't know why it's taking me so long, but anyway, I just don't have time. But one of the things he talks about a lot in there, and he's not the first person, but one of the things he talks about in there quite a bit is how the most successful people have often failed the most. And the, the baseball analogy also comes up. Who had the most strikeouts in history? Babe Ruth. Okay. But we don't know him for his failures. Who, who, who failed in trying to invent a light bulb 10,000 times? And it was Edison. So you have to persist. Now, you can't just keep losing trade, losing trade, losing trade. As I've often said, if you if you stopped out 20 times in a row, something's wrong. Either you're trading in less than ideal conditions, your stock selection could use a little bit or a lot of bit of help, or your stops are too tight. So you got to figure out what you're doing wrong if you're getting stopped out that much. But if you're getting stopped out within the normal – parameters of your system, whatever the methodology happens. And sometimes you just get bad conditions. Sometimes the market might take you out of everything, okay? And that's where you just have to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and come back in. So the other thing, too, to remember is with this market choppy like it has been, we've been super selective. I know I'm beating a dead horse on this, but you shouldn't have a whole lot going on anyway. I, I have a client that, that tends to overtrade. He had like 10 or 15 positions not too long ago. I'm like, what are you doing? We have I have like one or two stocks in my Landry list, which is a list I publish daily in the service. And you're along 
10 stocks, 15 stocks. It's like, no, no, don't. This is not the time to be doing that. You, you notice I'm drawing these arrows in the chart. Okay, we still have a major sell signal. It hasn't materialized yet. And then I'm drawing this arrow. These are all longs, by the way. Okay, meet on a pullback for arsenic. You want to meet me on a pullback? Uh, yeah, why not? That looks pretty good. A little wide and loose longer term, but it's kind of gotten its act together more recent times. And this one this has been on my minimalist as of late. But yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Put that on your watch list. Okay, Phil says, took profits, raised, stopped to break even, and stopped out, but sitting... Or do you know what in the triangle pennant? This RRC was one that was a little frustrating because it came within a few cents of the profit target. Four cents, I think, on this day here. And then within a half a point or so on this day here. Forty-something dollar stock. And then somebody asked me to serve. It's like, well, why? You, know, you, you talk about discretion. Why is it up to us? And the reason it's up to you is because the market doesn't move on exacts. And I told everybody, I don't know, 40, was it 45 and a half, 46 and a half, I forget. 45 and a half, I think, is what I told everybody. If it got above that, no, 46 and a half, sorry. Then seriously think about the discretionary call. So it did get within four cents of the profit target, and now it's backed off a little bit. But I still think it looks okay as a hold right now. I mean, obviously, my stocks always look okay as a hold because I'm following the plan, and I try not to question them until that stop is actually hit okay <laughs> so phil's probably phil's saying there's probably that 50 day move up oh, there it is that's the that's the fill pattern to pull back to the 50 yeah so that still looks pretty good especially if you look at that 50 day moving average i hear you on that one phil exxon mobile xom exxon mobile is going to be a, a thicker stock and get it up. Uh, notice the HV is only 14 on that, and RRC, which is a oil company. Notice our HV is 53. Okay, so that's about four times more volatile than the Exxon Mobil. So, not that I would never trade Exxon Mobil, but in order to trade it, I'd have to let it continue to break out of this range and then look to play it on a pullback. Let's back the chart out a little bit. No, it, it's got a lot of overhead supply over here. Uh, in the energies, the energies are still at are still coming off a of relatively low levels. So I try to find stocks in the energies that are coming off of relatively low levels that don't have a lot of trading overhead. Now it's going to be hard to find. I realize that, but that's where you want to focus on those. So let's just look at the RRC. Um, it was coming off of lows. It didn't have a whole lot. It had some trading, obviously, over here. You're going to have a left side of the chart, obviously. But it didn't have a big mound of, like, overhead supply. It looked something like this. Okay, it did back here. But then it got past that over here. And I think the setup was somewhere in here. I forget exactly when. Okay. So you want to find something that's in the earlier fa early phases of coming back up. Uh, I'd stay away from the big fat stocks on the long side. Now, maybe on the short side, some of those big fat stocks might be worthwhile soon. Okay. Okay. Regional Bank H band. Um, the that's the problem with the banks. I'm bearish on the banks, but they're kind of all over the place. And this is not really a short that's set up at this time. They can be a little choppy too. Uh, I wouldn't short it because it's not one of my setups. It would have to break to new lows and then consider it. But I hear you. I think it looks like it's in trouble. Shorter term, I'm sure it's a bow tie. Yeah, it's a bow tie or was a bow tie. Um, but I don't really see anything to go after there. Cone also on a pullback. Cone on a pullback. All right. Well, it's a REIT, and I'm not too excited about REITs as a general statement, but it's done okay. I could, I, I hear you. Um, 
Yeah, it would have to continue to follow through and then pull back. But it's a stock that's that's 22 in HV, still kind of low for a long. But I hear you. B U Z I for Gary. B U Z I. Um. Well, the first thing I see, it's a bit of electrocardiogram and all over the place. Okay, so I would pass based on that. But if it broke out to new highs and started trading cleanly and its personality began to change, then I might uh, change my tune on that one. XLU is going to be an ETF on the utilities. Um, it's making new highs. And this is where, as a momentum guy, I have to talk out of both sides of my mouth. Sometimes when you're playing the only game in town, it could be kind of dangerous in a market that's kind of sideways. Let's take a look at bonds real quick. The utilities is probably a reflection of what's going on in the 30-year bond, and we're up here at all-time highs. I know this ETF doesn't go bar. Yeah, I guess so. I guess it goes far back enough to see all-time highs. Yeah, it's all-time highs in bonds. So uh, where can interest rates go from here? And, and I know market could always go higher. Don't get me wrong. But you have to wonder how much higher can bonds go? But Dave, you're a trend guy. Yeah, I know, but rates can only go to zero, right? So this, theoretically, um, bonds can only go so high. So I don't know. It's just hard for me to get excited about utilities, uh, HV of 14. I hear you. They're headed higher, okay? But wait to see if they can keep going higher, then maybe look to play a pullback if that's what you want to play. Or maybe try to find a little bit more inefficient utility issue within the utilities and go after them, okay? But I, I can't argue with the uptrend. Angelo wants to know about B Corp. Um, let's see. Are we getting any? Has a little, yeah, it's got a little, got a lot of overhead supply along the way. So I think I would pass based on that. Uh, your 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 upside is capped. Yeah, it might be a good problem to have if you got in and it got to that overhead supply. But I think I would just let it go. I mean, it's nothing really to trade there. And it's also not set up. In order to set up, it'd have to rally, keep rallying, and then pull back, get past this overhead supply. And then by the time it did that, then you're dealing with this overhead supply. So I'd pass on that one. E-C-R for Mr. Rick. Um, well, I don't like stocks when they gap lower against the trend. So you got an uptrend and then you got a gap against the trend. So usually I'll toss them out just on that. Sometimes if they're commodity related like this one is, I might consider them still because uh, sometimes they can get jerked around by an online commodity. So I think I'd pass on that one. I hear you. Longer term, it looks like a bottom. Well, there's your IPO pattern if you have the ipo course or just watch the intro video on the on the website on the sales page i talk about sometimes they come public and just die there's a perfect example of that um so i think i'd pass on this one maybe see if it comes down bottoms out again begins to take off again e x a s for mr peter e x a s First thing jumps out at me, you've got this big gap down here for whatever reason. So usually when I see a big gap down in a stock like that, I usually tend to avoid it. The next thing is it just kind of chopped around here. It's trying to break out a little bit. Uh, so it would have to follow through to the upside and then pull back. But the fact that you're going into this big gap, that would sort of turn me off on the position. And the reason big is there's a vacuum that, that, that occurred at that spot, and there's a lot of people looking to get off at break break even, get out of break even, get off the hook, I, I think is what I'm trying to say. So I would pass based on that. Okay, any more? SCTY, bars, bars, SCTY. That's going to be a solo stock, correct? I used to be a solo stock. Um, 
Well, if you draw a horizontal line, as I often do, you can see it's going mostly sideways. Yeah, it might be bottoming out, but so far it's going mostly sideways. And then it has some resistance to deal with along the way. It's a little bit too much of an electrocardiogram, so I would pass on that one for now. ONVO. Longer term, a little wide and loose. Intermediate term, looks like it's trying to get its act together. Uh, on a pullback, maybe. Okay. Looks like it's getting through some overhead supply. But then it's going to have some more overhead supply. That was kind of a long time ago. Ask me in a couple weeks. Let's see how far it goes, and let's take a look at the pullback. Let's reevaluate that framing within this overhead supply. And by the time all that happens, let's see what the market's doing. Okay. You're welcome. I do welcomes for two earlier, but you're welcome too. <laughs> um, first thing I see is a bit of an electrocardiogram. We zoom in a little bit. Notice this trend here. It took off and then it went kind of like on a sideways drift and then it pulled back and then it took off again. So for me to get excited, it had to break out to new highs and accelerate higher. And let's back this chart out a little bit. In this particular case, I'd almost like to see the stock make all-time highs and then reevaluate in a pullback. Because I don't, I'm not a big fan of trading into a prior peak like this, possible double tops. AMPH for Sam. Yeah, we just talked about that one, huh? Oh, sorry about that. Brain fart. MBLI. Did we talk about that one? All right, let's see what we got. Yeah, I mean, you got this huge day today, but what else do you have? Not much. It's kind of all over the place. You got all this trading in here. Here's another case where, I, believe it or not, I'd almost like to see Brand new highs and stay there before getting too excited. Matt says, would you discretion to take profits early like RRC? Should you bring the stop to break even or keep it down lower? Is it the profit target wasn't hit yet? If it moved to break even, then you got stopped out. Um, I don't try to obsess too much in the first half. I guess I need to have a rule for that. I, I guess the rule would be be willing to get stopped out at a, a, a loss on the second half as long as you're profitable overall um, because you do still want to follow the original game plan as best you can, okay? And I hear you if you're doing that discretion. But keep in mind with discretion, you're only talking about a small amount. So – I wouldn't obsess too much on the first half of the trade. I wouldn't get too worried about uh, saying, well, Dave says if we hit the initial profit target, we need to come up to break even. But I think I would just come up to where wherever the stop is, okay, in following the general game plan. I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth. But the thing is, don't obsess too much on the first half of the trade. But if you are close at a profit target, absolutely, and it just can't seem to get there, and the market looks iffy, and, and all these other things are happening, then by all means, take the partial profits on, on the stop. Bump your stop up, but try to keep it within the parameters that are, that are set in the service. You can keep it a little bit loose. And then once you officially get past that, initial profit target then come to break even because that's what the original plan was in the first place discretion the problem with discretion is it introduces more and more decisions to the process but you also have a brain in your head and i believe you should use it and that's why i, I teach and preach discretion because the market doesn't always move in exacts it's like like this stock will go up to i think we we're looking at I forget the profit target or whatever, but let's just random example. Uh, I'll have a profit target at, at 20 bucks and a stock will go to 19.99 and then come back in. And then somebody will email. Well, Dave, why do you set the initial profit target at 19.99? It's like, well, 
the market doesn't move in exacts. If I if I were that good, you'd never see my fat ass again. But the, the thing is, nobody is that good, okay? And that's where using your brain a little bit. I'm not saying discretion and saying, oh, well, my stop got hit. I'm going to wait a few years to see if it comes back and watch it go to zero and go bankrupt. I'm not saying that's that's not discretion. Discretion is like, okay, stop is hit. I know I need to get out. Let's give it a little few minutes here. See what happens. If it trades below or much below my stop, I'm going to go ahead and get out. Uh, profit target is at 20. Eh, it's at 1999. Can't seem to get above 20. Eh, what the hell? Let's let's go ahead and take profits a tiny bit early on this. And all these little discretionary things are usually just, just the first initial management of the trade. Once you get into longer term trend following, there's less and less discretion needed because your stop is so far away. You're just riding out the zigs and zags, hopefully riding out the zigs and zags. Did I just say hope? Longer term, okay? All right, Matt, you got it? Good. Sometimes I need to stop myself from <laughs> pontification. Okay, we talked about that one, uh, ACC. And the recording will be up uh, within, it takes about two hours for me to get a recording up. So on some of these stocks you guys are asking about, I already talked about them, so you'll see them in the recording. Nothing, I don't think much has jumped out just yet. Yeah, this is another REIT. It is accelerating higher, so it's got that going for it. Everything I said about the previous REIT, low volatility. If this is an interest rate play, then eh, you could be a little late to the game. But I hear you. And the only problem is, the other problem with relative strength, even though I'm a huge relative strength fan, don't get me wrong, but when you're in a market like this, where you only have a few areas that are doing very well, such as the REITs, it's kind of a dangerous game to play. And I've been showing this to my peeps in the service quite a bit. Uh, foods, for instance, okay? So foods are at new highs. You're thinking, oh, I'm going to buy some foods. And then look what happens. They implode off of those highs. They're trying to come back a little bit. But you get the idea. And if you were looking at shorter term relative strength, like the semiconductors, they got creamed in this last little slide. So that's the problem. Manufacturing, another good example. So I'm a huge fan of relative strength, don't get me wrong, but when things are kind of iffy overall, it's kind of dangerous playing that it's always a bull market, there's always a bull market somewhere again, okay? Because those last little few relative strength areas are going to get hit really hard. If anything, it's almost, there would almost be shorts once the market begins to roll over, because the bigger they are, the harder they fall. They're going to be the first to go down. WBA for Mr. Ken. WBA. Uh, Walgreens Boots Alliance. It's just too wide and loose and sideways. I, I don't see anything. Draw your line, okay? And you can see it's just it's just kind of all over the place. It's not really doing anything. It looks like electrocardiogram, so I would pass based on that. Uh, try to find something that's a little bit more uh, – trades a little more cleanly. Jim, we can't talk about that one. That's the setup of the day. But good eye on that. Congratulations. Somebody's paying attention. Feel free to join the service if you want to <laughs> see what that is. Uh, I'm such a tease. We talked about this one, yeah. So just watch the recording. You'll see it. Oh, Phil says, I bought Mobley three days ago on 221-day MA at the recent double bottom. Fundamental story, however, I know how much you hate them fundamentals. Yeah, I'm not a big fundamental guy. Yeah, and to each his own. And I realize you're usually moving averages and stuff. And, and for, usually I agree with you on what you're doing, especially with the 50-day moving average. But there's more than one way to skin the cat, and I realize that, and that's fine. And it's not my way or highway. Now, I'll tell you, if pressed, why I don't like certain methodologies. I don't like pure mean reversion trading because pure mean reversion trading, you're not supposed to use a stop. And mean reversion trading means that when markets are falling out of bed, you step in and buy them, kind of like the S&P 500 did over the last few days. And then the idea is that they're going to snap back. Well, that'll work until it don't. And and I get more clients, and I see, I didn't mean to go off and mean reversion people, but that's just an example of, I'll give you my opinion. Um, what's that old saying? If, if 
If I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. <laughs> But I get more clients from mean reversion probably than, than all other forms of trading combined. It's like people go out and get their ass handed to them. And then they say, okay, Dave, I get why the mean reversion guys like it because it's like it makes it look like, oh, you could just, you know, you're smart and buying and selling the markets, but then you get creamed and I can't live with that. So let's just learn how to trade some trends. ACC for art. Yeah, we talked about that one. See the recording? Excel. And if anything's screaming by, I'll, I'll tell you, um, so you don't have to wait for recordings. Yeah, this thing's all over the place. Uh, I would have to see new highs and maybe a pullback. Shorter term, I hear you, it's kind of like a TKO a little bit, but longer term, it's kind of a mess. So I think I'd pass on that one. And again, I'm kind of like Mikey. Okay, I hate everything, and that's because I'm framing everything, especially within the overall market. This one looks like a stock that has bottomed out longer term and looks pretty good. And notice that your 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 main main major overhead supply is 200 300 percent away. So bigger picture, that looks pretty good. Uh, shorter term, it would have to break out to new highs, and then I would look to play a pullback on that one. So yeah, that's something that definitely needs to be in your watch list. Okay. The only thing's a little scary, HV getting a little high, closing in on triple digits. And the run has been pretty significant up. It's already up three or four hundred percent, but I think longer term it might be worth watching. SELB is a thin one. All right. SELB, as long as you make going in, it's thin. Yeah, it, it's just it doesn't look uh I'm not seeing anything just yet. Yeah, it's yeah, it's really thin. And IPOs are tricky. I mean, I talked probably for an hour just on volume of IPOs. But, yeah, initially, though, it did have some good volume, okay? But because it is so thin, this might be one that you want to wait for that secondary signal. Rick says, SWN, thanks. I'm learning every day from you. Oh, I appreciate it, Rick. SWN. Um... This was one I took off my momentum list yesterday, I think. Uh, it had kind of shaped up in here, but now it's just kind of sideways. Uh, bigger picture, longer term, it still looks like a bottom, but it would have to break out to new highs again. Now, this looks like something that you that if you're following the methodology, you could certainly be long, kind of like that RRC or even like CNX. CNX, okay. Uh, even though it's going sideways shorter term, you could still be long this because it hasn't stopped out. So, uh, yeah, but just kind of sideways lately. So wait for it to break out and then look to play a pullback on that one. Don wants to know about ETE. Oops. ETE. Uh, same sort of action as that other energy stock. It looks like it's bottomed out longer term. Not a whole lot of overhead supply for a while but mostly sideways as of late so it would have to break out decisively and then look to play the pullback yeah greg's saying are these ever recorded they're always recorded unless i forget to hit the uh the click button so they'll be up on youtube join my youtube channel and you'll get a um i think you get a notification from youtube as soon as it's live but yeah as soon as i get done like literally two minutes after i, I end the webinar I hit process, and then it takes about two hours for the processing to, to get done and me to get it up. You're welcome, John. TOK? I do appreciate you coming to the live show. Yeah, Karen, this one maybe on pullback, uh, pullbacks along the way. You know, it is foreign, so it is going to be a little choppy. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, though, because it's a foreign stock, okay? A little bit on the thin side, but not too bad, given its price. Yeah, maybe on a pullback, uh, there's a few caveats in here because it is a foreign stock. I'm not too worried about the gaps against it because it's trading in, uh, I don't even know what's, what country this is supposed to be. Perusian, Perusian, PT, Telecomunus case. Oh, Indonesia. Okay. Yeah, on pullbacks, it might be worth a shot. Uh, unfortunately, though, 
again, you're playing the only game in town, and that's the only problem there. Uh, that's why in more recent times, you'll notice that we did play a lot of those transitions off of lows because those stocks that had been beaten up, beaten up longer term had the most potential when they make the turn, such as the energies and the metals and mining, because the overall market was somewhat iffy at that time. So what could be kind of perverse is even though I preach trend following and strong trends and relative strength and all these things like momentum, what could be a little perverse is sometimes you do catch one like this and it looks pretty good. You're doing okay with it. And then the overall market begins to rally. And sometimes they could become a source of funds. In other words, they've done so well that people begin selling them to buy other stocks. Okay. So in general right now, at least lately, I've liked the more speculative issues, the IPOs, and then a lot of these issues that are coming off of low levels like the energies and metals and mining. But obviously, things are changing fast, so check back often. And GVT. And GVT. Uh, maybe on a pullback, um, it kind of was off to the races and then it kind of lost steam in here. So let's see what happens on a pullback. It could set up as a possible double top knockout, a little bit on the thin side, but it is an IPO. It's fairly high price, so that's not too, too bad. But yeah, let's see. Let's see if it has like a knockout move, like a trend knockout move. I can't really draw it on here because it won't let me draw a down line. Uh, but yeah, maybe on a knockout, like if it knocked out to, let's say 31 or so, at least to 31. So keep, yeah, definitely keep an eye on that one. Put it on your uh, watch list. Okay. Any more? Uh, while we're at an impasse, obviously I want to thank all you guys and girls for coming. I appreciate you taking time on a busy schedule to be here. Going once, going twice. All right. Uh, thanks again. Hey, if we don't talk to you now and then everybody have a safe and happy fourth of, July, anything unanswered, feel free to shoot me an email. Anything you want to see next week uh, or like me to cover, feel free to shoot me an email on that too, and I'll be happy to uh, to work it in. Uh, if not, uh, everyone enjoy your 4th of July. Uh, if you are not in the United States of America, then uh, happy Monday. <laughs> Again, happy 4th. Thank you so much.